Hello, welcome to Midweek Life. My name is Josh, your host. Um, we are going to take several weeks and we are going to talk about a certain subject that is heavy, that is real, that's prevalent, um, and that really just needs to be talked about, especially going through the year that we just went through. Um, people are grieving. And so that's what we're going to talk about for, for several weeks is grief. We're going to talk um, about how we can process grief uh, in a healthy way, maybe gain some tools in that aspect. And then uh, even more importantly, uh, for those of us, how do we sit with people who are grieving? So this is our grief series. This is part one. Okay. And today <clears throat> I have a special guest because she's family. This is my sister-in-law, Brenna Meisner. Hi, Hello. thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. I asked Brenna to join me today uh, because she has a story to share with us. Um, there was a time of her life where she experienced some pain with the loss of her father, who died by suicide almost 11 years ago. Um, and so I asked her to kind of kick off this series and just uh, talk about her dad. Can you just share with us, you know, looking back 11 years, you had a ton of time to to think about your dad. Man, what were some things that you loved about him? Gosh. <laughs> You're going to make me cry right out the gate. <laughs> um, what's not to love? He was the biggest person I know. Anything he did. Um, <clears throat> sorry. He never did anything halfway. It was always the biggest or the best. Um, he <laughs> would... Uh, he always liked to cook and to create things. Um, he had these pumpkin seeds. They were Sparky's pumpkin seeds. And he had this whole plan of what he was going to do with them. And um, they were so good. <laughs> they tasted like beef jerky. Mm -hmm. um, he had this whole process of first you soak them in a marinade. And then you put them in the fridge and take all the air out of it for like four days. And then you had to put them in the oven and slow bake them for a month who knows <laughs> just this whole process um, it was an art it was an art and everything with and my dad it. was an art and he loved it um we did he was really um into fireworks and not just the backyard lighting fireworks we went to conventions of many many memories of um you know traveling in a car to wyoming and mason city iowa the Pyrotechnics Guild International, we were all members and we all learned how to make fireworks and make the little parts in the fireworks and mm -hmm. it was a whole thing. And So when you say he always did everything really, really large and big, like what when you, as soon as you said that, I was like fireworks. Yeah. Yeah, that dude was so <laughs> into fireworks. My dad was a manic depressive bipolar. So he had really high highs and really low lows. Um, so he was, he was diagnosed with that? He was diagnosed with that, yep. At one point he had been committed. Um, during the whole process of the last probably year of his life. Um, and he had been diagnosed and put on medication, um, which it's a telltale sign of bipolar disorders. You feel better, so you stop taking your medication and then That's with anything. things ensue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel it's great, so. Part of it. Don't need this, yeah. Um, so with his mental disability that he had, um, like I said, in hindsight, that he's always had it my entire life. But when I was a kid, that was just dad. He just was big. <laughs> and those were his highs. And highs and lows. And highs and And you were lows. just used to that. That's and I, dad yeah, was. I think I can speak for my family and just looking back, absolutely. But in the, when you're in it, and I mean, that was, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, when we were experiencing all of that, nobody talked about it. You didn't. Mm. You didn't know. <laughs> it's kind of hard to talk about that type of a diagnosis, being bipolar. Mm -hmm. And honestly, like, I feel like uh, grief is, like, there's still a stigma attached to grief for some reason. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yet, I find people talk, like, when it comes to depression, when it comes to being bipolar, when it, in, in, when it comes to grief, it's like, oh, no, it's better to just kind of, like, hide that away. It's better to just kind of suppress that. Yeah. And like, just, just, just deal with it. So did you ever feel like there were moments where you were like, man, we got to talk about this? Or was it always just like, well, that's just who dad is. I was pretty young for most of it. 
So I think I always just you were chalked the baby, it up. Weren't you? I was the baby. Yeah. Yep. I was 23 when he passed. Yeah. So basically, <laughs> I mean, so so you were in high school and junior high. You were a kid. Yeah. Going through this stuff, right? It wasn't. You didn't really have the the emotional maturity or the awareness to to actually look at it and be like. Maybe we should get this looked at. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Well, and right at the end, probably the last year of my dad's life, too, um, a lot of big things culturally happened. Um, me being the baby, I moved out. It was him and my mom by themselves after, you know, 20 years of having kids and a life moving around them and not focusing on each other and working on that part of things and the flood happened my dad lost my mom and my dad both no lost mate. their jobs so not only were they with no kids they were constantly together at home alone trying to work through all these big issues like not having a job and and figuring out how to pay the mortgage on top of it and I think just it was a perfect storm I know who Dave was uh like we would disc off a lot um, and I remember sitting with him when Sis was born. <laughs> I remember sitting with him in the waiting room. And that was really special, just to kind of sit with him. I remember he, he, he got up to go to McDonald's, and he brought back a uh, breakfast burrito meal with hash brown. And I just remember being like, man, he is my guy. Because <laughs> you don't get anything but that at breakfast <laughs> at McDonald's. Your dad was a special dude. He was, he was, he was such a unique, a unique <laughs> man. Uh, personality wise um, kind of a loose cannon right like mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he kind of kept you on your toes as far as what he might say or do and all my friends in high school thought he was a pastor <laughs> oh really <laughs> because of just how he much made... he preached <laughs> to how much he preached at home we had a um, growing up we had a bible sign in our front yard which a lot of probably the older generation in Cedar Rapids will remember it um, over on 35th street, it's a white little sign and he would change out the Bible scripture every couple of weeks or so. But one time somebody decided they were going to hit it with their car and take it out cause they didn't like it. Well, my dad wasn't having that. And he dug probably four feet into the ground and put cement <laughs> and buried this pole and they came back and tried to run it over and oh my goodness. It completely like ripped the front end off their car. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Just sharing the gospel. Yeah, everyone to anybody has, and everybody. <laughs> everyone has their own approach to it. That's uh, that's funny. That's yep. cool. So you were 23 when your dad passed. Yes. And it was almost 11 years ago. You just had your first child. She was 13 months old. She was 13 months old. How did you grieve? Honestly, I didn't. It was um, not that any suicide is expected, but it was really not expected. Um, it was kind of like walking into a wall. There was no notice. No notice. A big part of my grief, um, which I've just recently kind of figured out in the last couple of years, is I have a lot of memory loss and a lot of times that just chunks of time that I don't, I mean, I remember it, but not very clearly, kind of just going through the motions and Maybe compartmentalizing and, a little bit. Yeah, I think so. With being young and just having a kid, um, I was going through my own things emotionally with everything that happened before um, he had passed still. Um, Jordan and I were kind of in a weird place in our marriage and still learning <laughs> how to do that. You were just a few, a few years in your marriage, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it was maybe two months after he passed, we decided that we were going to move to Des Moines. <laughs> and I, at the time, it, I think it was one of the best things we've ever done um, for our marriage and for the grieving process. It kind of took us out of the environment we were in, which had gotten really muddy and kind of toxic and hard. And it just kind of picked us up out of that. and Kind of a reset. Yeah. We came back, but... <laughs> you, we all come back. <laughs> Cedar Rapids, man, we all oh. make our way back. Um, <laughs> could you try and describe uh, what what that looked like and what that felt like when you actually had that moment in Des Moines where it all came, it, it all kind of came to a head? Yeah, I I wasn't working when we were there, so I had a lot of time to myself. 
Um, we were also in a new place and I don't do well with not knowing where I'm at and directions and things and I would get into a panic and there was, it wasn't a specific moment, but there was a, a section of time where I just didn't leave our apartment mm. and I just was exhausted and we just were there. <laughs> Jord um, had moved for a job and the job had kind of fallen through. So he was also out of work. Um, our apartment had this crazy, awesome pool. <laughs> we spent the days in the pool and just that our family time, I think, is what kind of brought me back mm. from all of that. Just being able to sit in it and, yeah, process. There was a lot of, for lack of a better word, excitement around the time when it happened and the funeral and the, you know, all the gatherings and the things. And I think when all of that calms down and the hubbub is, you know, past, it's easy to move on and everybody goes back to their normal lives and you're expected to be normal again. And maybe not expected, but it feels, I mean, life's moving on. You have to get catch up. <laughs> and I think that part of it is hard specifically too with a suicide situation because it's such a shock and such an abrupt like life-changing thing that it's important to have those people that check in Man. past past the thing and, and in the future when life's supposed to be normal funerals are just an event for the majority of the people but for the close ones who are directly affected by it like that is a <clears throat> life-altering tragedy that's big so <laughs> that would be my encouragement and i've and i've heard it said before and at, at funerals is um i've heard pastors being just basically just call it out be like hey listen you need to call this person three months <laughs> from now you need to call this person a year a year from now three years from now because um they will need encouragement and support for a long time for much longer than we think so that's yeah that's real stuff. It's huge. So we were living at your parents' house. <laughs> yeah. Our parents' house. Yeah. Um, during all of this. And I have a vivid memory of a night. Um, Edwin and Diane Hung stopped over. And I will not ever forget it. I don't remember exactly the whole conversation, but it was such um, a comfort she also has had experience with suicide in her past mm. and she kind of shared her story and it was really cool to see someone that had been through it and was doing well. So that kind of gave you hope. Yeah. That yeah. you'll be all right. Yeah. How do you process it with, with, uh, with, with as an Riker? Um, cause they know about, <clears throat> they know of grandpa Dave. They do. Um, so how how do you approach such a traumatic event with children, especially at their age where they are inquiring? They're smart. Yeah, how did how would you approach something like that as a parent? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I recently um had been on with Courtney on her mm -hmm. podcast show thing and we had talked about my dad as well and working from home and doing that from home, Aslan was going to be around and she knew Grampy had passed and she knew he was sick, but she didn't know about the suicide side of it. And she, I mean, she's 12. We just hadn't gotten there yet. And so I had to sit down with her and I said, you know, we're going to be talking about Grampy and I don't want you to hear me talking. I'd rather have a, you know, have a conversation, be able to explain it. And I just kind of told her and it was hard but and she cried and broke my heart and <laughs> but it was really um it was a really sweet moment with her I bet. what about Riker she, uh he hasn't we haven't had that yet <laughs> with Riker he's still a little young he's he's nine he'll be 10 this summer yeah I'm sure it's soon but yeah he's, he's like you said he's smart <laughs> The truth of the matter is, is there, is there are people grieving all around us. There are people currently grieving watching this. I guarantee it. Um, from a loss of a loved one or a friend or a loss of a job or, or whatever. Uh, what, would be, what would be your advice 
to someone who is currently in the thick of of pain. Um, it's not going to go away, but it does change. And you find happy memories and the good in the really crummy bad. <laughs> and it's going to always hit you um, super randomly <laughs> in the grocery store when the certain song plays or when you're kid asks you about their grampy <laughs> but uh, it does change and it does get better I try to not let myself sit in the grief because it's really easy to do that and it's really easy to fall into that hole and it's okay too sometimes yeah. I mean you need to feel it you need to process it um, but talk to people about it don't, yeah. don't hold it on your your own shoulders. Yeah. And, it's, and, it, and it circles back to this idea of grief should not be a stigma. Grief should be openly talked about. Your pain and your tragedy should be talked about. Do not suppress it. Uh, do not isolate yourself. Yeah. Um, because that can uh, not only mentally and emotionally harm you, but that can also physically harm you too. That could that could directly affect your physical health when you suppress such painful things. And so, yes, talk to someone. Uh, th this concludes grief part one with my sister-in-law Brenna. I'm so grateful for you coming. Thanks again. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. <laughs> yes, thank you. And uh, and we'll see you next time as we continue this series on grief. <laughs>